Hi, Dr. Boatwright. It's nice to meet you. Hi, it's nice to meet you. And congratulations. The students have um, pretty much unanimously decided that you will be the next spotlight. I'm honored. I think it's very fun. Yeah. Um, so I will start by asking you um, just to get this out there. How long have you been teaching and how many of those years have been here at WCU? I have been teaching now 20 years. I started teaching in 2000 and the past eight years have been here at Western. Nice. And you teach um, English education, correct? <coughs> I do. So I primarily teach methods courses and the teaching of reading, writing, and grammar. And um, every now and then I will teach courses in uh, comp and ret. Okay, cool. Um, and then um, I will go ahead and get started with the student questions because as I told you, you have very many. <laughs> uh, they were very curious about a lot of your favorites too. Um, so we can go through those. And if you want to um, go into detail or just answer a quick, this is what it is, um, either or is fine with me. Um, so first one, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate, peanut butter, swirl. Nice. Um, and then next, kind of in the same line, ish food related. What's your favorite grocery store to shop at? Um, that would be Earth Fair and it actually closed down all of its chains um, early in this year and then they just reopened their flagship store in Westgate in West Asheville and I'm just really happy that they're back because they were in Asheville tradition and started here in like 1975. Nice, that's cool. I'm glad they're back open too. Um, so if you could eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? And someone else had asked, what's your favorite food? So I think that's kind of the same question. That, that was a nice combo. Um, I would say anything that is offered on the plant menu and plant is a vegan restaurant on Merriman Avenue in, uh, in North Asheville. It is delicious. The, uh, chef of uh, plant is Jason Sellers and his partner is Laura Wright, who is one of my colleagues in English. And not a lot of people know that. Oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. <laughs> and we take out a town guest there who may not even be vegan and walk away just raving about uh, how amazing it is. So it's it's in, anything on the menu there is is always just so terrific. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. And um, everybody watching should probably check it out too. Cool. Three. So I would say that that is probably your favorite restaurant then. Right. Yeah, yeah. nice. Um, so if you could eat dinner, probably at Plant, uh, if you could eat dinner with any three people from history, who would you choose? I would choose, my three people would be uh, Nina Simone, she was a musician, activist, and uh, she's actually from North Carolina. She's from Tryon and just an, an amazing uh, musician all around, amazing performer. Um, John Lennon, of course, one, one of the Beatles. And then Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think would be very fun to have dinner with. And I, I do a lot of research on him. That's cool. Now, would you eat with those three at the same time, or would you do one one each? Ooh, I, I hadn't thought about that. Probably just one on one. I think that would be a better atmosphere. I think John Lennon would be a lot to handle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like maybe. I, and I, I envision him being a lot to handle, and I'm, I imagine Emerson being a little bit aloof and standoffish, but maybe not. I've actually heard he's, he's a very compassionate friend. Yeah. Cool. Um, so similar question from history. Um, someone asked if you could travel to any time period in history, what would you choose? Yeah, that was a hard one. I actually picked uh, the 1960s London. There was so much going on with uh, the British invasion of rock and roll with um, 
the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. There was just so much great pop culture stuff that when it came over to the States, it was just um, really amazing and how it's, how it's changed the pop culture. So what would it have been like to be there and to see those early shows and those bands were just starting out and going to those clubs and seeing them for like two bucks, yeah. three bucks. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Right. And then maybe you could have dinner with John Lennon. Right, yeah, after the show. Uh, so kind of switching gears then a little, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? If I could have any superpower, it would be telekinesis. Because I would like to look at an object and move it just a few inches. <laughs> and then move it back and see if anybody noticed. <laughs> that would be fun. So just a subtle shift in reality to see if anyone goes, hey, I put that there and it's not there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I think that might, that might possibly drive people a little crazy, <laughs> but hey, it'd be fun. <laughs> All right. So no, but I, I would only use a superpower like that for good. I would never use it. To be, right. It would, it would, it would only be just for, for fun. A little party trick. Yeah, a little party trick. Like, hey, I can do this with my mind. <laughs> it would certainly be a great uh, conversation starter. <laughs> yeah. All right. So moving on to movies then. Um, what, is, what is your favorite Star Wars film? And I assume that you are a Star Wars fan because someone asked this question. <laughs> um, yes, and I can predict the student who said it, but I won't. <laughs> Say that student's name because it might not be that student. Um, that would have to be Empire Strikes Back. Okay. And what's your favorite non Star Wars film? Uh, this was a hard one. Um, I said Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, my wife and I are in the process of watching all of Stanley Kubrick's movies in reverse order. And we watched that one about this time last year, and it, it still holds up as a as a really gripping movie of, of what back in 1968 they kind of anticipated what the future was going to look like. Cool. Uh, I haven't seen that one, so I'll have to put it on my list. Um, and then back to Star Wars, but um, which Star Wars character does your personality most closely align with? Well, and I think my students want me to put Yoda, but I think I have to say Chewbacca. Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm, I couldn't really align with any other characters. Um, I think he's, he's loyal. He's dedicated to the cause and his friends and he's fuzzy. So. Got it. <laughs> It's like uh, uncanny then. <laughs> right. Uh, so what are you going to be for Halloween this year? Um, that's a fun one. In years past, I have certainly participated in Halloween and gotten dressed up. Last year, I was a uh, Mugatu um, from Zoolander. I don't know if you've seen Zoolander. Or I haven't. I know about it, but I haven't seen it. It's It's pretty kitschy and funny um, it's from I think it's from the year 2000 as well maybe before a year after that um, but uh, this year I'm going to be COVID safe and I won't be dressing up I won't be going anywhere and um, I hope all of my students also play it safe but still can enjoy the Halloween weekend mm -hmm. Plenty of, plenty of great movies or books or scary things to do at home and COVID is scary enough. So. <laughs> that, that is true, yes. Uh, I was going to suggest watching movies. Are you and your, your wife going to be continuing your marathon? Um, probably not this weekend. Um, we may watch, uh, we may watch something. I, I feel like there's always, you know, there's such a, such an abundance of, of programming out there like that right now and streaming mm -hmm. services and it's really hard to pick um, something to watch. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll pick a fun scary movie we haven't seen in a while. Nice. Or, or something completely new. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoy your COVID safe 
uh, Halloween weekend. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Um, all right. So a few other favorites before we get into some more uh, serious questions. Uh, sure. What is your favorite animal? Um, it would have to be cats, and I have three of them. And I, I shared a picture uh, of, of our three cats, um, and I will happily let you know their names if that picture yes. needs a caption or whatever. Please. I, will, I, I will share that with you. Even without that, I would love to know their names. <laughs> uh, well, and I'll just let you know right now. So the white one is named Kiko. Um, she's um, a little bit geriatric, but she's still very sweet. Um, the fluffy long haired black one is Birdie because she chirps. <laughs> and then the tuxedo one is Frankenstein. Nice. Because w why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I didn't name Frankenstein. Uh, that was my wife's cat before we met, and she named him Frankenstein. Nice. It's a good name, solid name. <laughs> um, all right. So, and then I will show the picture in the blog post as well as it will be on Instagram Okay, good. in the post too. So people can find it either place. Uh, what is your favorite hiking trail in the area? Um, I would pick uh, Rainbow Falls. I think it's a, a really a gorgeous hike and you do see several falls. I think there's Turtle Turtleback Falls is a part of that trail and maybe um, Horse Tooth if I'm I might be messing with that name, but it's a, uh, it's, I think it's near Sapphire, North Carolina. Okay. Um, not too, it's, it's certainly in um, Transylvania County, okay. near, near Lake Toxley and those, uh, in, in that vicinity of the state. Nice. Just, just gorgeous hiking and in the summer, getting out in the water is, is, is great. We, we take friends there when they visit, when we had friends who visited. Right. <laughs> Prior to this, hopefully next summer. Yes, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yes. All right. Uh, and maybe staying COVID safe for Halloween will, will help a little bit toward that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, and similar travel type question, I guess. Uh, what's your favorite place you have visited? Uh, my wife and I in 2016 went to St. Martin, which is in the... Um, um, French Antilles. I think I'm messing that up. And the cool thing about that island is it's the only island on the planet that is owned by two different countries. Hmm. And it's kind of split in half. And it's a, um, they call it the friendly island. That's, the, that's their um, nickname for it because there is no uh, border between the two. It is the, the northern part is owned by the French and the southern part is owned by the Dutch and you can just cross back and forth freely. Cool. Um, and and it, it, it's just a gorgeous island um, to visit and uh, you know, the French were amazing and, and the Dutch were also great. And you, most people, at least Americans, would land on the Dutch side and you just drive up. You can drive the entire island in about an hour and a half. It's, it's that small. Oh, nice. But it was it was lovely. So that would have to be one of my favorite trips. Cool. Um, and then we will switch gears to English. Uh, yeah. What are your top three favorite books? Oh, this one's so hard. A lot of these when it's like, what's your favorite? It's like, well, I... <laughs> what, what, what time of the day is it? It'll yeah. It's like, what's your, what's your favorite Beatles album? Well, it's whichever one I'm listening to right now. <laughs> um, but um, if I did have to pick, um, I really like Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. I've, I've taught that one before. And um, another one would be The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. Or the Chronicles? Um, by Haruki Murakami. And... The other one, and completely unrelated to the fact that I have a cat by the same name, would be Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I would have asked if, it, if that was related. <laughs> it is unrelated. I've, I've read it several times, and I've taught it, and I have a lot of students that teach it. And I think it's just a fascinating book by a woman author from that period in time. Yeah. And, it, and it's just so relevant to what's going on right now. 
um, with science and the, the politics of ethics and all that. Cool. Um, and then this is, I don't know if this is related or, or not, um, because it could have been one of your top three favorite books, but what is your favorite uh, specific young adult book and why? Um, uh, I would respond to that by saying that it is Angela Thomas's The Hate You Give. It's, it's, there's a movie adaptation of it, but it, you know, it couldn't be more powerful and it, and it couldn't be more relevant. Mm -hmm. And um, I like teaching it and what it teaches us about race and in this current year with, um, with just the completely enormous movement of, of Black Lives Matter and the protests that have uh, really persisted since uh, George Floyd's murder. Mm -hmm. Obviously several um, Black uh, lives that have been lost um, due to police brutality and violence and the fact that we need to revise that. All that plays into this and it's from the perspective of a, of a Black teenage adolescent and how mm -hmm. she copes with it. And so I just think it's you know, it's not only incredibly well written, but it's it's so it's so powerful. Yeah, nice. and yeah. I, I teach that one, and we're actually reading that next week in my class. So if any of my students happen to uh, uh, watch this video and are in my class, well, that's uh, that's what we're doing next week. <laughs> nice. Be prepared. Read the book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because it. Apparently, it's a powerful one. Well, <laughs> a good it is. Read. And, and why I lit, you know, it's supposed to be at a, a simpler language because you can, in theory, teach it to younger readers who are really just coming of their, uh, into their own as readers. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important. I think it's especially important in a, a region like Western North Carolina, which is historically um, quite. Um, homogenous, especially a lot of the schools once you get out of, say, Buncombe County. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's Latinx populations here and there, uh, obviously um, Cherokee here and there, but um, it's, it's important for students to read about things that they don't see every day and realize the world is bigger than they are. And, um, I'll, I'll just stop right there, but it's, uh, yeah. it, it's an important read. Yeah. And I haven't seen the movie, but I will. <laughs> Okay, good to know. All right, and last favorite, um, what is your favorite thing to do in your spare time? Oh, I, have, I have a lot of, of those. Um, I love reading, um, running, uh, spending time with my wife, Sarah, and our cats. Um, I love spinning vinyl. I, love, I wouldn't say maybe a, maybe a healthy vinyl a, a growing vinyl collection it's it's my name <laughs> no means monstrous or anything, but um, I, I, I do like the uh, I, I like the aesthetic of, of vinyl yeah and, yeah I love streaming too I have Spotify and, and I love listening to new stuff but there's something about listening to a record that is very intentional and you have to sit back and go all right I'm intentionally putting this record on I'm dropping the needle I'm going to listen to maybe this entire album side, whereas with Spotify, there's so much randomness and you can, um, you can just pick and choose, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's great. And if you go out thrifting, you just find so many weird records out there from like, there's so many weird things like, oh, I'll just buy this because the album cover is super weird and it's only a buck. <laughs> nice. All right. And what is, the, oh, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but your Enneagram type? I think um, that's how you pronounce it. I'm not quite sure what that is. And I looked it up briefly. Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what is that? Um, I think it, it's one of those personality type things. And I know that there are quizzes out there that you can take. Um, and off the top of my head, I would not be able to tell you which one is the one that I've taken, and I don't know mine off the top of my head either. So that might be something that your students might have to, to say, hey, you should 
You should take this. Great. If they send me the quiz, I'll let them know what my uh, what my score is on it or what it tells me that I am. But nice. I'm not familiar with that. Okay. And the big question of this week that was was sent many times to many professors. Do you believe in Bigfoot? Absolutely. Okay, that is settled. <laughs> Full stop. He or she or they is out there. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on, <laughs> because I don't think we can we can argue with that. Uh, tell us about your Beatles poster on your door, and someone has asked this week after week. Um, that is a, a very rare <laughs> poster from a, a really great friend in Asheville who is a musician. He was a radio DJ in Charlotte, and I think in the 80s when they were reissuing the Beatles catalog, they just sent that out to radio stations. Um, and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I'm sure on eBay you can find just about anything, but um, I, I thought it was super cool. And for people that haven't seen it, it lists every Beatles song in, in order of when it was released throughout their entire career on just one poster. Wow. So and how did, cool. how did you get it? Um, he, he just, he was uh, moving houses and he said, hey, do you want this Beatles poster? And I said, well, of course. <laughs> it's, it's a little beat up on the edges. Um, yeah. But, that's awesome. I'll have to see if we can get a picture of that um, to include in the post. Yeah. Um, cause I, you're not on campus, are you? Um, infrequently, but, but feel free to go up. Go up. I'm, I'm doing uh, the majority of my coursework um, and the majority of my teaching online this month. Yeah. I'll have to reach out and see if um, maybe Maggie can get a picture of it for us to, to post. <laughs> sure. Uh, so apparently, I did not know this, but apparently you used to be in a band and someone wants to know what the name of that band is. And that question was so weird because um, as professors, we say so many weird things all the time when we're teaching, whether it's to get an example across or to communicate something and make it more relatable but obviously at some point i said i used to be in a band <laughs> and um late high school early college i was in a band called the secret of 42 and the name of the band comes from um the uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy because mm -hmm. oh, there's, there's a section in there where that the number 42 comes up cool uh, we, have long since, we have long since, uh, we are long since defunct. There might be a random tape out in Atlanta of a demo somewhere, but. Interesting. That's a fun fact to know about, about your professor for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of teaching, why did you decide to become a teacher? I want to say it's because it, ran in the family. I don't know if I was conscientious of it at the time, but as I look back on it, um, my mother was an English teacher, an eighth grade English teacher in Atlanta. My grandfather on my mother's side was a statistics professor at Georgia Tech. And uh, one of my nieces right now is an elementary school teacher in Atlanta. So there's gotta be some kind of a common thread that's drawn me to it, um, maybe my personality type, but uh, it's, it's one of those things that if, if you, when you step back to look at it, you think, oh yeah, there, there, you know, there must be something that really kind of resonates with me. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so generation after generation, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's awesome. And you said that you've been doing most of your teaching online, um, so, someone asked, how are you navigating online questions and do you have any tips? And I'll expand that to say, do you have tips for student teachers as well as students? Um, I do, um, I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, I will say that it's a learning curve and it's, um, it is different from face-to-face. -face. And I think we have to treat it differently than face-to-face -face instruction. 
um, there's much more intentionality involved early and there's much more planning that goes on early as you're setting up your course. And then there needs to be uh, quite a bit of active engagement, at least on my part, to make sure that students are not only making sense of the content and the content is resonating with them, but just to make sure that they're okay, especially when they're on screens all the time. Um, it, it can be draining when we do our Zoom meetings each week. Mm -hmm. um, so I, so be intentional. That, those would be my tips. Be intentional uh, while still being flexible because just like in a face-to-face -face classroom, things change um, all the time. That's just a part of being a, a good teacher. With the online stuff, you need to take breaks often. I think kids get drained, especially high school kids. If they're um, learning all day on a on a screen, it's 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 different because um, the, your attention span. I, you know, I think a lot of the research says your attention span when you're on a screen is far different than your attention span when you're with a live face to face human who's talking at you. You read their body language. Um, you, you can sense when students are getting it or they're scratching their head because they're not getting it. So mm -hmm. breaks are really important um, uh, because uh, students do feel the fatigue like we all do and uh, try and be protective of your time uh, because it's, uh, it, it's easy when you're, when you're student teaching, I think, to... Uh, um, to really let it be all consuming. And as so many of our student teachers are working at the same time. So try not to let it be, you know, I guess a better way to say this, you know, try to find um, even small brief windows of time for yourself, whether that's watching um, The Office on Netflix and just having it on in the background or, or something just for a few minutes mm -hmm. and, and um, just, just trying to be productive of your time. Nice, thank you for that. <laughs> Um, and so last question then, and I will group this student question with a question that I ask everyone. Um, mm -hmm. They ask any advice for future graduate students. And my question is what advice do you have for students? So I think that's similar, probably going to be a similar answer. Um, I think for graduate students, one of the things is, first and foremost, you can't read everything. You're going to want to read everything. As a graduate student, you, your eyes are open to so many avenues of research. You become fascinated by everything. When I help students with their comp questions, they usually start out with trying to answer every sort of question, every type of, um, you know, they want to follow every fun lead and do all this stuff. But, you know, your time is precious as a, as a graduate student. So it's, it's important to know when you need to read a book thoroughly. Like when you need to read something top to bottom, like a novel, or it's a really, really important piece of research that's central to what you wanna do, reading that top to bottom. But then there's also an expression one of my professors taught me, it's important to know when you can read at a book. And I put that in scare quotes. And that just means knowing how to glean what you need from it, getting the information, maybe just reading one chapter or two and saying, all right, I get this, this scholar's argument and I can talk about it in a legitimate way that is, um, that validates that person's argument and then in turn um, supports the argument that I'm trying to uh, put forth. So no, knowing that you can't read, about, read it all because there's just not enough time and, um, and trying to figure out that balance of when I can just read bits and pieces of a book or, or a piece of scholarship and when I do really need to sit down and go, okay, I need to read this and maybe even read it multiple times. Okay. Um, and advice for students in general then? Um, during this, this period, um, you know, take, take, take care of yourself and, and find time to do little things, find time that brings you joy. This, this is such a stressful time. Um, there's so many question marks, you know, politically, what's going on in the world with, um, with the election coming up, with obviously when there's going to be a, a vaccine and some form of normalcy can be restored to how we are. Uh, and maybe we can even be better than when we were 
um, some people would argue that, hey, and I don't want normalcy how I knew it. I don't want to be complacent. I, you know, I want there to be a real change. Mm-hmm. Um, so finding finding time for yourself, you know, just because it's the, the world is overwhelming right now. Yeah, I think, I think words were said it uh, um, really well. They said the, the world is too much with me, or the world is too much with us, and I think we can all feel that weight sometimes. So finding that time for yourself, um, and just do do the little things that find that you find joy, whether it's. Um, you know, calling home or listening to music or talking to a friend or walking the dog, whatever. Mm-hmm. Or watching the office, as you said before. Or, or, or watching that. A lot of my students bring that up. Like that is their kind of, uh, like that's their chi when, when they're trying to find something to do. They'll just put that on and because it's multiple seasons and they'll have it on in mm-hmm. the background and that's like how they decompress to the world. And they're like, all right, the office is really perfect for that. You know, you can yeah. pick it up at any time and laugh because it's really funny. Mm-hmm. Or, or you can just have it going on in the background and it's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, and is there anything else that you would like to share for your time in Spotlight before we end this? Um, I, I would. Um, my students are some of the most amazing people that I work with. Um, yeah, I say that with all all honesty, and um, I really do believe that uh, their generation has the potential for a lot of change. I mean, they're they're the first generation coming up right now. That in their eyes, we've always, at least once upon a time, have had a black president. At least um, they are also aware that um, same sex marriage has been legal um, since they were very young, and so they've kind of grown up in that universe and really taking that baton and doing things about social justice and hopefully doing things with police reform and um, putting their putting their votes behind the issues that matter uh, most. Um, I'm, I'm Gen Z, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, or no, I'm, I'm Gen X rather. So I'm, I'm a couple generations behind, but I'm not a baby boomer. So I can relate to what they wanna do. And I think my generation tried and um, I think there's still work to be done, but I think this younger generation has a voice and it has a lot of power behind it and a lot of momentum. If, if the um, protest of the past six, seven months have really taught us anything, I think, I think, it's, um, I think it's a great generation. And I, I just, my students are awesome people and I think they're gonna do great things in the classroom. Nice. That's a, that's a great way to, to end this interview, I think. Um, Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for, for this time and answering these questions. It was great to get to know you. <laughs> it was good to get to know you too, Elizabeth. Thanks for uh, sending this out. And uh, I students can enjoy this a little bit or think it's silly. And I hope their questions were answered. If they have follow-up <laughs> follow yeah. questions to anything I've written, they're, they're more than happy to, to write me. And, uh, this is a real, real, um, real pleasure for me too. Good, nice. Well, I hope you have a great, um, again, COVID safe Halloween weekend. You too. Yeah. All right. All right. Take Bye. care. Thanks so much. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.